Hey everyone, this is Robert. Welcome back to my channel, Barter Hordes. It's Tuesday, so that means here in the United States it's new releases day. And I have five new titles I want to share with you that are out from publishers today. Uh, the first one is a historical text. It's called The Brink. President Reagan and the Nuclear War Scare of 1983, and it's by Mark Ambinder, and it's out today from Simon & Schuster. Journalist Ambinder's account of a serious threat of global annihilation, stemming from a 1983 NATO war exercise, is spellbinding. Ambinder lays out the grave weaknesses in America's nuclear command and control structure in the early 1980s. The process the president was supposed to use to make decisions about whether to launch nuclear missiles was much too long, and the U.S.'s early warning system was unreliable. These problems informed the Reagan administration's approach to the Soviets. In order to mask the U.S.'s vulnerability to a first strike, Reagan sought to add to America's nuclear arsenal, feeling that the best way to reduce the threat to the U.S. would be to increase the threat to the Soviet Union. The practical implications of this dysfunction manifested during Able Archer 83, an annual dry run of the transfer of NATO's nuclear warheads from American control to European custodians, when a change in communication methods and patterns gave the Soviets the mistaken impression that the exercise might be a cover for an American first strike on the Soviet Union, which then readied troops and nuclear weaponry to respond. While disaster was averted, Ambinder illuminates the fragility of existing safeguards against an unintentional launch, a timely topic given concerns about Iran and North Korea. He also walks the reader through the Reagan administration's and the Soviet government's respective internal debates about diplomatic and military strategy. This is a masterpiece of recent history. So that's called The Brink, President Reagan and the Nuclear War Scare of 1983 uh, by Mark Ambinder. Uh, the second title is a novel. It's called A Terrible Country, and the author is Keith Gesson, and it's out today from Viking. In Gesson's exceptional and trenchant novel, floundering 30-something professor Andre Kaplan flees from New York to Russia, the country of his birth, to reassess his future and take care of his ailing grandmother. Called abroad by his enterprising older brother Dima, Andre arrives in Moscow to find the city of his memory surreally changed, his 89-year-old grandmother's apartment one of the few spaces exempt from a partial, a partial westernization. Andre's early attempts to reorient himself to post-Soviet Russian society bring about considerable insight and humor. Getting rebuffed by a men's adult hockey league, getting pistol whipped outside a nightclub, leading him back to watching old Russian films with his grandmother. Eventually though, Andre carves out a place for himself among a group of leftists known as October, whose ranks include Yulia, a devout radical with whom Andre embarks on a romantic relationship. Gessen, the author of All the Sad Young Literary Men, meticulously forges these bonds before casting them in doubt, as Andre's involvement in a protest complicates the new life he has built. While poised to critique Putin's Russia, this sharp stellar novel becomes, by virtue of Andre's ultimate self-interest, a subtle and incisive indictment of the American character. So that's A Terrible Country, a terrible country by Keith Gessen out today from Viking. Uh, the third title is also fiction, and this is one that has already gained a lot of traction on BookTube and the interwebs. Uh, it's My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfeg, out today from Penguin. The latest from Booker finalist Moshfeg, following the story collection Homesick for Another World, is a captivating and disquieting novel about a woman's quest to sleep for a year. The unnamed narrator is in her 20s, lives alone on the Upper East Side, has plenty of money from her inheritance, and decides to hibernate with chemical assistance in the year 2000 in order to drown out her thoughts and avoid the world, since she, quote, hates everyone and everything. 
Her only relationships are with the cashiers at her bodega, where she picks up meager supplies like coffee and animal crackers. Her quack psychiatrist, Dr. Tuttle, who dispenses pills like candy, and Trevor and Reva, her on and off boyfriend and college friend respectively, neither of whom she likes much. For a while, the narrator's plan works. She takes upwards of a dozen pills a day, watches movies on VHS, and willfully blanks out her life. I was more of a somniac, a somnophile. But when Dr. Tuttle's medication regimen intensifies and the narrator experiences strange, activity-filled blackouts from a drug called Infermiterol, she escalates her plan with potentially fatal consequences. Though the novel drags a bit in the middle leading up to the Infermiterol plan, it showcases Moshfeg's signature mix of provocation and dark humor. Following the narrator's dire trajectory is challenging but undeniably fascinating, likely to incite strong reactions and much discussion among readers. I'm wondering if that's code for half of you will love it, half of you will hate it. Uh, it's My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfeg, out today from Penguin. The fourth title is called The Tangled Tree, A Radical New History of Life by David Quammen, out today from Simon & Schuster. Science writer Quammen, the author of The Song of the Dodo, as he has so often done before, explores important questions and makes the process, as well as the findings, understandable and exciting to lay readers. Here he delves into the field of molecular phylogenetics, the process of reading the deep history of life and the patterns of relatedness from the sequence of constituent units in certain long molecules, that's a mouthful, namely DNA, RNA, and a few select proteins. Although the topic might seem arcane, he brings it to life by profiling many of the field's most important players, including microbiologists Carl Wosa and Ford Doolittle, and demonstrating how it has changed the way scientists understand the shape of the history of life. The breakthroughs Quammen describes include Wosa's classification of the archaea, a new category of living creatures made up of single-celled microorganisms, and Doolittle's insight recounted in an interview with the author that genes can be transferred horizontally between organisms and not always closely related organisms, rather than simply between parent and offspring. The cumulative effect is to transform Darwin's famous image of evolution as a straightforwardly branching tree of life into a tangle of rising and crossing and diverging and converging limbs. This book also proves its author's mastery in weaving various strands of a complex story into an intricate, beautiful, and gripping whole. So that is The Tangled Tree, A Radical New History of Life by David Quammen. And the final book that's coming out today that I want to share with you is Ann Tyler's newest novel, Clock Dance, comes out today from Knopf. Pulitzer Prize winning Tyler, following A Spool of Blue Thread, takes a bittersweet, hope-filled look at two quirky families that have broken apart and are trying to find their way back to one another. Plaintive Willa is the link between her own fractured Pennsylvania family, rebellious sister Elaine, long-suffering dad Melvin, and tempestuous and abusive mom Alice, and that of lonely Baltimore single mom Denise and her precocious, love-starved daughter Cheryl. The novel's first half follows Willa as she negotiates her troubled teenage years in the 1960s and her 20s and 30s in the 70s, her reluctant marriage to college sweetheart Derek, and her late-in-life second marriage with stuffy retiree Peter. The narrative then jumps to 2017 when Willa gets a breathless call to come to Baltimore to help take care of Cheryl, the young daughter of her son's recent ex-girlfriend, as Cheryl's mom, Denise, recovers from a mysterious shot in the leg. There, Willa settles amiably in a neighborhood of misfits, hooligans, and steely survivors, and explores her own family miseries. 
The cast of sharply drawn characters dominates in ways both reflective and raucous across a series of emotional events, such as Willa's baffling encounter with a would-be hijacker, a heartbreaking moment with her elderly dad, and the jolting advice she receives from a kind-hearted doctor. It's a stellar addition to Tyler's prodigious catalog. And so that's Clock Dance by Ann Tyler out today from Knopf. Okay, there you have it. Reasonably short and sweet. Five new titles for you to check out. If you are already planning to read one of these or if you've already read one of these through a, an advanced reader's copy or something like that, please let me know your thoughts. Um, I'm still trying to decide which of these will end up on my TBR and I'm always glad to have your responses. Uh, until I see you again later this week with a tag or Friday Reads or some such book shenanigans, uh, have a great week, everybody. Bye.